Hi there, everyone. This is just a quick intro here. This is part two of the first Roman Jewish war. If you want to go check out part one, I'll have it somewhere in the description or something like that. But if not, no worries. Hopefully you enjoy this one. And let's get into it. Now, for the remainder of the year 67, Vespasian continued clearing out the rebels along the coastline. And when all was said and done, the estimates are that around 100,000 Jews were killed or sold into slavery by the time the summer came to an end. In Jerusalem, even though the Romans were no longer in control, it was actually about to get a lot worse for the people living there. Because, without the authority of the Romans holding everything together, the cracks started to show very quickly between the various groups of Jewish people. The city was packed full, and the three largest groups of Jews didn't really get along with each other. The provisional government that was put in place back when the Romans were kicked out of Judea, the zealots who had been streaming into the city ever since their losses in the north to Vespasian, and lastly, the Sicarii, the group of Jews that were extreme to the max. They are the ones who would go around and kill everybody they didn't like. I mean, Jews, Roman, Greek, didn't matter to them. And now, when you put three large groups of people who don't really see eye to eye on very crucial things together, it usually doesn't end up well, and there's no exceptions in this story. It didn't take long for violence to break out headed by the Sakari and the Zealots. They pretty much just started to execute anybody they thought might even be thinking about surrendering to the Romans. In response to the violence, a leader of the provincial government by the name of Ananus ben Ananus. This, apparently, is the guy who ordered that Jesus' brother be stoned to death. Uh, he began to speak out against the two other groups of Jews and told his followers that it was time to stand up against them. They were robbing and killing their fellow Jews and using the temple as their base of operations, which was definitely not the intended purpose of the temple, to say the least. And now the Zealots and Sakari. I'm just going to use Zealots from now on, but you get the point. The Zealots, who were held up inside the temple at this time, got word that Ben was gathering an armed force to try and get rid of them. So, they didn't just sit back and wait for him, no. They jumped up right away and began to go through the streets of Jerusalem, attacking anybody that they came across. Ben, hearing of this, got his men together as fast as possible and met the Zealots in the streets. And at first, the two groups, you know, they just sat at a distance from one another, threw some rocks back and forth, you know, like two groups of school kids fighting after class. But eventually, the rocks turned into javelins. And shortly after that, full-on hand-to-hand combat in the streets of Jerusalem was going down between Jewish people. After some hard and bloody fighting, the zealots were pushed back into the temple and trapped there by Ben and his 6,000 men. But Ben wasn't trying to have a full-on siege of the temple, so he decided to send in a messenger to negotiate with the zealots. The messenger was a man named John of Gascala. John seems like a real dickhead, because after being trusted to talk with the zealots, this guy goes into the temple and tells them, Look, you've got two options. You can either surrender, and most definitely die, either because you will be executed for your crimes, or just because the people... They're going to go full-on vigilante mode on your asses as soon as you leave this temple. Or you can ask for some help from an outside group of people. And John knew just the perfect group. So, with time running out for the Zealots, they drew up a letter that was then sent to the Idumeans, a.k.a. the Edomites. And the letter said that, oh my god, please come and help us. This crazy bastard Ben Ananus is going mad with power. And he's actually surrendered to the Romans and is going to give control to them of the city of Jerusalem. And if you don't come and save our asses right fucking now, well then, you'll be next, and the true Judaism will be gone forever. These Edomites, they have been converted to Judaism ever since they began to live in the southern parts of Judea under the Hasmoneans. So if you're uh, wondering why they would care, it's because of religious reasons. Well, when Ben learned of the 20,000 approaching Edomites, he ordered the city gates to be shut and the walls to be manned. And when the Edomites showed up outside the city, they were like, yo, what's going on here, guys? Like, how come you're locking us out? We're all Jewish here. Why would you bar us from the city that we share in common? 
unless the letter that we got was true, and that you guys are holding the true Jewish people hostage in the temple, and you guys are going to surrender to the Romans. The men on the walls, they tried to shout down to the Edomites, that like, no, no, you've got it all wrong. The zealots, they've been robbing us and shit. This actually has nothing to do with the war against Rome. We just want these guys gone. We're not actually going to surrender to Rome, you friggin' you idiots. But it was too late. That night, it said that a thunderstorm blew over Jerusalem, and in the middle of it, some zealots snuck out from the temple with saws and made their way to the gates where, under the noise of the clashing thunder, they cut the bars of the gates and allowed the Edomites to pour into the city. They found Ben and his men still waiting outside the temple. The 6,000 men fighting for Ben had no chance against the 20,000 Edomites and were slaughtered to a man. After being saved from the temple siege, the zealots then went through the city and massacred any commoner they could find. The Edomites finally learned of the trickery that got them to come to Jerusalem in the first place, and that Ben and the other group of Jews, they had never actually reached out to the Romans. Though nothing is really said about it, or how they felt, but this is actually the last time we see or hear of the Edomians in the historical record. It seems after the first Jewish-Roman war, they just kind of seem to fade into history. In the springtime of the year 68, Vespasian was back on the move. His army had been taking one Jewish stronghold after another, making great progress against the Jewish rebels. When about halfway through the year, news arrived from Rome, stating that Nero, the emperor, had been deposed and had ended his own life. The new emperor Galba would only last for a couple of months before being assassinated by a man named Otho. Vespasian didn't really throw his name into the ring until the year 69, where the legions under his command hailed him as emperor. He would leave Judea under the control of his son Titus and head back to Rome where he would put an end to the turmoil caused by the year of four emperors and establish a new imperial ruling family which will in turn turn into the Flavian dynasty. Skipping forward a bit here now to the year 70, the Vespasian has won the civil war against his enemies and is now emperor of Rome, and Titus is in command of the legions in Judea, and he and they have made their way to the famous city of Jerusalem, which is absolutely packed to the brim with people at this point, with all the refugees who have been fleeing the advancing Romans. Knowing this wasn't going to be a quick and easy victory, Titus set about making plans for a full-on siege. He surrounded the city with four legions, the 5th Legio Macedonica, the 13th Legio Fulminata, uh, the 15th Legio Apollinaris, and the 10th Legio Fratensis. Then, Titus ordered that a trench be dug all the way around the walls of Jerusalem basically trapping everyone inside. And for the final touch, Titus had walls built with towers that were just as high as the walls of the city. And with that, Jerusalem was surrounded. It said that anyone that was caught within the area between the walls would be crucified on a big dirt mound facing the city. And apparently one day, there was at least 500 crucifixions done. The initial spearhead of the attack started just north of the Jaffa Gate, where the Romans attacked the Third Wall. This wall had just been built shortly before the siege began, so the Romans had little trouble breaching it, and by the end of May, they had actually managed to breach the Second Wall as well, which pushed back the defenders to the temple and the upper and lower city. Life for the people inside Jerusalem was getting really bad. At this point, the zealots were going around, uh, sorry, were going overboard with their violence uh, that they were committing against their own people. And there was quite a large portion of people that began to speak of surrendering to the Romans. Well, in response to that, the zealots burned a massive amount of food that they had stockpiled. Because in their minds, they thought that it would incite the people to fight harder against the Romans. But all it ended up doing was causing people to starve to death. Nice. 
Now, after the Romans had fought their way into the city, they wanted to take the fortress of Antonia because it would give them a perfect vantage point to assault the temple where the majority of the rebels were held up. But even after managing, managing to take that, the Jewish rebels were still fiercely defending the temple. In the back and forth bloody fighting between the two sides, a Roman soldier is said to have thrown a burning stick onto the walls of the temple, and even though they wanted, uh, Titus wanted, the temple to be spared so that he could hopefully transform it into some sort of a temple dedicated to the Roman pantheon, there was no stopping the fire once it started, and it started to spread very, very quickly. And as the flames spread all throughout the city, the Jewish defense crumbled as the rebels began to flee. Our friend Ben, who now goes by Josephus, was actually there to witness the fall of his people. He describes the scene. As the legions charged in, neither persuasion nor threat could check their impetuosity. Passion alone was in command. Crowded together around the entrances, many were trampled by their friends. Many fell among the still hot and smoking ruins of the colonnades and died as miserably as the defeated. As they neared the sanctuary, they pretended not even to hear Caesar's commands and urged the men in front of them to throw more firebrands. The partisans were no longer in a position to help. Everywhere was slaughter and flight. Most of the victims were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, butchered wherever they were caught. Round the altar, the heaps of corpses grew higher and higher, while down the sanctuary steps poured a river of blood, and the bodies of those killed at the top slithered to the bottom. Josephus says that Titus didn't want the temple destroyed and that it was all the fault of the common Roman soldiers, but I think he was just trying to curry some favor with Titus, since, you know, his dad was now the emperor. But uh, after the siege, Titus ordered that the walls and defenses of Jerusalem be torn down. The only thing left, really, was the western portion of what used to just be a retaining wall, not even part of the actual temple itself, that we now know as the Wailing Wall. Josephus also claims that one million people, mostly Jewish, were killed during the siege, but that's obviously a highly inflated number. The 97,000 slaves, though, is thought to be a much more realistic number, but really, it doesn't matter that much. What we do know is that many, many people lost their lives during the siege, and that many, many more people were driven from their homes and the land of Judea afterwards. Now, that's pretty much the major part of the first Jewish war. There is just one more event I'd like to mention, and, and that, of course, is the Siege of Masada. Now, if you remember from earlier, I just briefly mentioned Masada and the Sakari. Well, a lot of them were still just chilling at Masada, going out for raids every now and then, and the Romans weren't just going to let that happen. So in the year 72, two years after the fall of Jerusalem, the Roman governor of Judea, Lucius Flavius Silva, led the Legio Fertensis, some auxiliary troops, and about 15,000 men and women, Jewish men and women, who were prisoners of war to Masada. Where they surrounded the hilltop fortress with a wall and began construction on a huge siege ramp. Now, Josephus doesn't speak of any attempts by the people in Masada to sally out and stop the Romans from building this thing, so, in the spring of 73, the ramp was finished. Lucius Flavius then ordered that a massive siege tower with a battering ram be built. The Romans would use this to breach the walls of the fort, and when they finally did, what they entered into was like a house of horrors on steroids. The last Jewish defenders had set all the buildings on fire and had killed each other as a last defiant act against the Romans. They found only seven people alive out of the 967 that were said to have been in the fortress. And now, this is what Josephus says happened, but modern takes on the event lean much more towards it actually being a Roman massacre that killed the remaining Jews left in Masada. 
At this point, the Romans, they were in no mood to take prisoners, and I highly doubt they would have accepted a surrender by the Jews. I honestly think that uh, think the Romans, when they finally made their way into the city, again, just lost control and slaughtered anybody that they could find. But now that pretty much is the end of the first Jewish-Roman war. There's some mopping up operations that take place, but nothing too important. The modern estimates here are uh, that around one-third of the Judean population had been destroyed, either by the Romans, starvation, infighting amongst the Jews themselves, and also being sold into slavery. Jerusalem itself is said to have lost 90% of its population. The upper social class of Jewish society had been completely wiped out. The priestly class and the arist aristocratic sorry, uh, oligarchy that was run by the families who controlled the priesthoods and other important religious roles, that was basically gone. And with the destruction of the temple, Judaism, it, uh, Judaism itself was changed. It went from a religion based around worshipping at one temple and being led by one high priest to after the war, Jews, they began to rely much more on their sacred texts and began to use the synagogues uh, that were all over the place as a place of worship and rabbis as their highest levels of religious authority. The Jews, even though they've lost this war, they will not forget the loss they suffered against the Romans. And in about a lifetime from the end of the first revolt, will revolt again, two more times actually. I should be covering the Kaitos War in the next video, and then finally the Bar Koba Revolt. The latter is the war that is the reason why the Jews were expelled from Judea, and why we now know it as Palestine. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed. And have a good one.